In addition to all of this, Juliet has participated in being a faculty mentor in the Kirkness program and was a participant in the MOSI Mobile Summer Institute uh, for Active Engagement in Active Teaching uh, two summers ago. Uh, and so today she'll tell us about her experiences with a flipped classroom. Thanks, Juliet. Thanks, Danielle. So. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. I'm actually really excited about the flipped classroom that I offered. I offered it for the first time last uh, winter, and I'm offering it again this coming winter. So I, I'm, you know, I might ask you for ideas during the talk. So uh, this is the title of my talk. Uh, I'm flipping out. Active engagement works. It's so exciting. <clears throat> but a more sober title might be using evidence-based teaching practices in physics. Okay, so. You all have your clickers, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna do the, the chin vote. So one for A, two for B, three for C, four for D, et cetera. Which choice below describes how you would like to learn physics? Okay, think about it for a minute, and if you want, you can talk to your Neighbor? <laughs> We've got some brutally honest members of the audience. <laughs> this is actually uh, one of the first things I showed the students in the class for active engagement uh, to, uh, for the flipped classroom to get them sort of used to the idea and the, to introduce them to uh, the idea of active engagement. Um, so yes, some students said A. Um, some students said B, which is sort of a traditional lecture. C is what we did for the flipped classroom. Watch pre-lecture videos, and then during class time when I'm there with the students, I can help them with problems, and they did uh, peer instruction as well. And uh, they got lots of opportunity to test their understanding before they had to perform in an exam. Um, some students said D. They had a great physics teacher. They know everything. And they just have to take this class to get uh, credit at the university. Um, and some students said they would prefer to read the book and practice the problems and never come to class. OK. That's what we're gonna do in, in the class, in the flipped classroom. Okay, so what do you think the professor cares most about? Any of you ever taken a physics course? I've had several professors say I needed to memorize the formulas in case I was ever stranded on a desert island. Not saying it'd be a bad thing to know the formulas, but. Okay, chin vote. Okay, three seems popular. This is a trick question. Oh, I care about all of those things. Um, I do try to actively recruit even first year students. I take undergraduate students every summer. Okay, so here's a little bit more serious one. How much more effective is active engagement than a traditional lecture? Read all the choices and then if you want, you can discuss with your neighbor. Discuss with your neighbor. <laughs> Chin vote. Hey, you're hiding because you don't have a partner. Oh, okay. OK, 
Okay, if you're ready, go ahead and uh, vote. Okay, there's lots of fives. Okay, so let's see. A, B, and C are all true. Average grades are half a letter higher. Failure rates under traditional lecturing are 55% higher than with active engagement. And peer instruction can move a student from a 50th percentile to a 70th on a standardized test like the MCAT. So there's some sources. My lecture will be available so you can go and read some of those things. And E is not true. Even if a professor doesn't want to do active engagement in the classroom, if they do, it improves learning gains. Okay, so the flipped classroom. There's no or very little lecturing during class time itself. So what did we do? We did lots of clicker questions with a think, pair, share model. Uh, so you think about it yourself, pair with a partner, and then we all come together and discuss the responses. Um, I did lots of activities, including concept maps. I would have the students write questions because it changes how you're thinking about the material. If you have to write a question that is able to be interpreted by your fellow students. Um, I did concept simulations. Now for physics, there's lots of those available, uh, FET simulations. I'm sure there's other uh, online resources for other fields. Um, and I did a lot of demos with the predict, observe, reflect model. Uh, I wanted to do a demo for you today, but I decided that I wouldn't be doing it right because when I do a traditional lecture, when I do a demo, it takes maybe five minutes. How many of you do demos in your class? How long do you usually take in a traditional lecture? Five minutes, maybe. You want to show them something that they can see it in the real world. I didn't do a demo unless I was willing to spend the whole class period doing the demo. And one of the demos I did was very simple. It was just dropping two strings into pie pans. And I did it many, many times, had follow-up questions. It took the whole period. I also had backup clicker questions just in case it doesn't take the whole period, but I've ne I never once used those backup clicker questions. And there was lots of peer instruction. That's almost a must in a large classroom to have peer instruction. Um, so the students work in groups, they teach each other uh, the material. And I'll, I'll explain to you how I uh, did that. And then I used UM Learn as the staging area. So last winter I used a sapling book um, because that publisher had pre-lecture videos and quizzes that would link directly in UM Learn. Um, and I used the Sapling online homework as well. But in our department, the first year students use a book by Wiley, Cutnell and Johnson. And uh, we don't want to have to make them buy more than one book for a first year uh, you know, series of courses. So I am switching to um, use the Wiley Plus book, uh, even though it's not linked. Although this semester, it might be linked. <laughs> Still sorting that out. Um, and I did the same, the same, our labs and tutorials are a little bit separate from the class, so they were the same as a traditional lecture would have. And another change I made is that I added multiple choice, uh, I added long answer questions, sorry, our midterm and final for first years are usually uh, multiple choice uh, out of expediency, not because we think that's the best way to assess, uh, but I bit the bullet and added the long answer questions. So <coughs> this is an example week. As I said, I always had backup clicker questions in case the activity I had planned uh, didn't take long enough. So before class, the students have to watch pre-lecture videos and complete the bridge assignment. That's, uh, there wasn't always one for Friday, but usually one for Monday and Wednesday. Uh, during class, I would answer their questions. The first thing at every class, the first slide that they did have slides, I usually had three slides. One of them was, do you have any questions? That's the first one. Um, and then I usually had one reminding them of upcoming assignments and things like that. Um, 
It evolved, that was my first offering last winter, so I didn't have the structure at the beginning of the semester and I will follow it uh, this coming semester. Um, it evolved to doing this, the clicker questions on Monday, uh, Wednesday an activity or demo. And then Friday is when they did the most peer instruction. So there's this thing called a jigsaw exercise and uh, the way it's supposed to work is that in the class, students are in two groups, their home group, like where you are now, so this might be your home group, and then uh, I would assign uh, breakout groups. So I said, okay, it's time for a jigsaw, everyone move around to their breakout groups. In the breakout groups, each group solves one problem. So every student in that group is working on the same problem, different problems. Once they can solve the problem, they go back to their home groups, Every member of the home group has solved a different problem and they have to present it to their home group. 45 minutes isn't that long <laughs> to do that. And the students actually requested that I assign the problem for the jigsaw exercise on Wednesday after class. And then they would work in breakout groups online from Wednesday to Friday. And when they came in on Friday, they would present their problem to their home group. So that saved some time. Um, and so each student had to present a, a problem to their home group. Oh, sorry, wrong thing. Um, and that was usually four or five people in a group, so four or five problems that they had to solve uh, presenting to each other. I did have to give some uh, enticement. Um, so you may even guess that the students would just each write down their problem and turn it in. So then I said, okay guys, I brought prizes. $5 gift cards to Starbucks. And I said, first group that says they can present a problem on the board gets a, a gift card for every member of their group. But here's the catch. I get to pick which member of the group presents the problem. So then they knew they had to make sure that every member of the group could solve every problem, not just, you know, sharing and and turning in. And it, that actually worked well. There were groups that never volunteered to present, but they still sort of got the message that this is how they were supposed to do it. They were actually supposed to be teaching the problem to their uh, group mates. Okay, so I also tried to um, have a little bit of uh, comedy to lighten the mood. Oh, I, don't, I didn't test any of the markers. So we're gonna do a concept map for teaching and learning. Okay, how many of you ever use concept maps in your classes? Okay, so I, um, I never did in any of my classes that I ever took, did I ever have to do a concept map? I should have checked these markers ahead of time. <laughs> um, okay. So the way I would do it is I, I would explain to the students what a concept map was, and the way I would exercise, uh, do the actual exercise is I would, oh, sorry, I'm not used to being on camera. I would, I would have them brainstorm as a group a few things. So, um, so for heat, for example, I said don't, anything you think of, you write it down, and then we're gonna try and put it into, you know, the, the, the context of heat. So even if it's something cultural like, oh, that person's hot, you know, why, why would we think that? So just, you can write that phrase down and then we'll try to, you know, you'll try to put it together in your concept map. So when I say teaching and learning, what are some things that you think of? I knew I should have bought the Starbucks gift cards. <laughs> Lectures, okay. Ugh. Anything else? Okay. Hunger. Skills? What? Sitting? 
practice. Okay, I'm going to say a few. So, teacher, student, coach. Okay, so I want you to think about not just um, the things that we have on the board, I want you to talk to your partners. Think about, say, if you were going to learn how to play the guitar, how would you want to learn it? What things come to mind? If you, were, um, if you have a child or if you have nieces and nephews or if you've seen young children, how do they learn? Think of things that have to do with teaching and learning. Um, if you have paper or you can take notes on your phone in an email app if you have nothing else, okay? So I'm going to give you a few minutes to do that. Brainstorm and then what I want you, well, brainstorm and we'll, we'll see if there's any common themes that come out. Then what I will have the students do or have you do is pick primary and secondary concepts and then see if these other things that we have brainstormed fit into those primary and secondary concepts. So anybody read the joke? Um, I'm going to play that YouTube video while you're uh, working. Um, so go ahead and talk to your neighbor.
Okay, so let's uh, come back to the front of the room. Uh, did anybody think of anything that they'd like to share with the class that's not already on the board? Um, motivation, I saw mimicry. What about the group that was talking about children? What were yeah, some of the yeah, things yeah. you so said? You mentioned children, and um, so thinking about how children learn. So children learn through play, they learn through trial and error, and when they come to us, they are still these little children who are interested <laughs> in learning through play and trial and error, and, but they have a fear of failure, right? So creating, I think, a space for them in which they can fail Anything else? Yeah? Um, choosing logic. So a lot of things we what we learn from is through examples. So um, can I extrapolate a little bit and say types of learning or learners? No. No? I'm gonna write that anyway. That might not be what you meant. So I think that um, there, there's different types of learning. There, is, uh, uh, there was a belief for a long time that there were different types of learners. So there were people who learned better by hearing and people who learned better by doing. That has mostly been debunked. But what is, what is important is active, active engagement. And that could be thinking. That could be listening. Um, you, it's, that's passive, but if you're actually thinking about what you're listening to, if you're self-assessing uh, your understanding, um, that's better. And clickers, by the way, are a good way to force the students to self-assess. I say, I just explained force to you. Do you understand what it means? Oh, yeah, for sure. And then I ask you a question about force, and you're forced to think about it. <laughs> and you realize, oh, wait, no, I, I don't. Okay, so I had made a whole bunch of, he before I came in, I had some, like, skills, uh, knowledge, uh, demonstrations. Um, one I had was benefits. So <clears throat> the students might end up having different concepts in their concept map. That's fine. What I usually found when it was something specific like, you know, heat and energy or, you know, kinematics or um, projectile motion, that things were a little more concentrated. <laughs> um, but the idea would be, um, you know, I would say, okay, maybe the teacher, student, coach, those are the players, right? Those are the, so a primary concept might be players. Who's involved in teaching and learning? Um, so teaching styles, maybe you might pull out lectures or, or learning style, play mimicry. These are all different ways that you can learn. Um, benefits, I heard people saying things like uh, curiosity. Does somebody else have a benefit? To learning. There was another one, I just can't remember what it was. Anyway, so the students would uh, use the period uh, to, to do this, then organize the, I, I encourage them to use PowerPoint because then it's easy to move the concepts around so you can make, um, you can make a primary concept in the middle which was teaching and learning and then have secondary concepts like the players, the benefits, um, the methods maybe, something like that. And then categorize all of the, the um, things that they've brainstormed into those secondary um, concepts. Um, if you do concept maps another way, I would be very interested in talking to you after the lecture, because um, I always have room to improve. Um, okay, so this works even for large classes. This class isn't that large. I had um, 102 registered students, 75 typically showed up. Yes, there were people at the final who I had never seen before, which was very interesting. I knew I had never seen them before because I had spent the semester <laughs> circulating among the class and talking to the students and looking at their faces. And a miracle for me, I learned 20 students' names. It doesn't sound like a lot, but for me, that's a big deal. Okay, so 
The eye clickers, if that's all you did, that's active engagement and also quasi, it helps to do the quasi continual assessment, self assessment for the students. The peer instruction is almost a must for a large class unless we suddenly had five times the number of professors so that we could have multiple people circulating in the classroom. Um, I'm a, as a student, I'm not a fan of peer instruction or group work, but as a professor, I'm a big fan. And I think that it benefits both the weaker students and the stronger students. The stronger students get to teach. So they get to solidify what they know. They need to organize their thoughts so that they can say it to the other person. And I know that that's how I learned some things the best, is when I had to teach them. Um, I had lots of discussions. I would walk the room. I would eavesdrop. Um, I thought people would chat and talk about things that weren't related to physics. That did not happen. Um, the, the class would be very loud, and I would realize that there were 75 students in that classroom talking excitedly about physics. And I am getting goosebumps right now because that is awesome. Okay? Um, we did the activities. Uh, this room is bad. <laughs> but you can make it work. How many people were working with someone that was sitting behind them? Yeah, so I would have the students do two and two, or two and three, groups of four and five, um, in two different rows. Uh, I was in an education 224, I think, I can't remember for sure. It was very shallow. This is very steep. So that would make it harder, but um, hopefully still possible. Don't be afraid to try new things. Respect the students' opinions. When they asked me if they could have the problems on Wednesday after class instead of trying to do the jigsaw work, I, you know, my first instinct was, you know, I, this is the way I wanted to do it. We're going to do this, you know, exercise in class. And then I was like, why, why wouldn't that work? <laughs> okay, let's try that. Um, if it didn't work, I would have said, okay, that's not working. Let's do something else. Um, I was able to make connections, listening to the students, encouraging them to get to know each other. And I don't know if you can tell, but I like being the center of attention. I've been described as ebullient. <laughs> so I use that skill and I bring it to the classroom. Not everybody has that skill. Use your skills. The important thing is that the students are doing the work. Um, and then discuss with colleagues. I asked <laughs> Danielle and Ruth uh, and, um, and other members of the faculty and we have the PALS group and I, I would bring things up there and ask, I don't know how many of you are members of PALS. I've been on sabbatical so I haven't seen all of you all semester but that is a great group where you can discuss um, things that you can try. Okay, so how do I know it worked? So um, Physics started doing physics education research in 1980 or so. And uh, over uh, many years, uh, decades even, a mechanics survey was developed that um, ensures that there's no semantics issues in the questions, that the, the concepts that were trying to be tested were those that were being tested. So we have that, that benefit. But there are um, such instruments for other uh, um, disciplines. So try to find them. If you're doing physics, there's not only mechanics, there's electricity and magnetism, there's quantum mechanics, there's upper level courses. None of them have really had the same amount of study as this initial mechanics survey. There's other mechanics surveys. Anyway, there's 13 questions about mechanics. They're conceptual. You give a pre and post test and then um, you use that to measure individualized learning gains for the students. Um, practical matters, uh, this was online at the AMTA SOAR website. So AMTA is the American Modeling Teachers Association. They don't just do physics, they do bio, they do chemistry, they do math. They have a lot of these resources that you might be able to use that are something like this. I learned how to do Microsoft Mail Merge. <laughs> I'm not very good at it even still, but the reason I did that is so that I could give them a link with a unique number uh, using Excel's random generator 
Um, and I didn't ha they didn't have to provide any of their personal information at the AMTA website. Uh, it would be easier if we had permission to provide that website with the students' emails. I explored that option um, and decided that it, it was just too questionable, um, or if the survey was in D2L. So this AMTA SOAR has the um, copyright to this quiz now. So, uh, but we could try to transcribe it into, into UMLearn. This is an example question. So they're all conceptual. Um, this is how it looks in the online test. This particular question isn't important, but this is um, just what the students see when they're looking at a question. And they come in concept groups, so there's more than one question for a given concept. There's 30 questions, there's about six concept groups. I haven't analyzed them at that level yet, I've just done the overall learning gains. Okay, I had a student, I had a TLEF grant. Um, and I paid for a student who's, um, I think he got a physics bachelor's and then he went to education, so it was like the perfect person to, to do this. Um, so he analyzed the data from that first semester. So we have all our normal assessments that we can look at. We have the pre and post test scores and then the individualized, individual normalized learning gains which are defined over here. So I have another slide on this. Um, the learning gain is defined as the post-test score minus the pre-test score normalized by the total number of points in the quiz, which is 30, minus the score that they get on the pre-test. So if they get the same post, pre and post-test score, that's a learning gain of zero. Um, and then uh, Sapling, a representative of which is in the back here, uh, very helpfully ran a focus group, so I have some of the focus group responses um, for that as well. So here's the normalized learning gains. I haven't delved into uh, this too much. I did do physics education research as an undergraduate. I will not tell you how long ago that was, although Danielle helpfully listed the dates that I graduated. Um, so this is a pretest score versus post-test score. So if they got zero on the pretest and the post-test, they'd have a learning gain of zero, so that's why they're zero all along this diagonal, if they got a, uh, a higher score on the post-test than on the pre-test, they would have um, a positive learning gain and uh, a learning gain of one um, is uh, 30 minus zero or um, et cetera, because it's normalized to the pre-test score. It's somehow weighted. I haven't talked to a mathematician about this, but I didn't realize this until I saw this plot here, that it's somehow weighted to being negative. Um, I haven't found any uh, literature to, that has addressed that, but it seems like you very quickly get more negative faster than you get positive going that way, but um, something to keep in mind. Uh, typical scores are in this box, usually. Um, and then here's a, this isn't my study, this is a different study, the citation is here. Um, so the typical normalized learning gains are around uh, 0.4 or so for their study. Okay, so before I tell you the results of that survey, um, I will tell you a little bit about the focus group results. There were three students and six questions, so 18 responses. The things they enjoyed about the class. They enjoyed working with other students. The class was more fun because there was much more interaction with other people. The things they didn't like, doing the learning themselves, having online only textbook. That was a choice that we made at the time and it came out that the students would prefer to have a paper textbook. Waiting too long for the rest of the class to answer an eye clicker question. I actually could use help with that one because I don't know what to do about that. Um, videos didn't cover enough examples. They always want more <laughs> examples. And they didn't like doing the learning themselves. In fact, 18 responses, the times they said or complained that they had to do the work or learning themselves was 10. So more than half of the responses said something about having to do the work themselves. And this had me very upset. I got this result back before I got the results of the analyzed FCI. And at first I was like, oh man, I thought they'd love it because they seemed so happy during the lectures, you know, we were all talking, people were active and, and interested and 
literally on the edge of their seats whenever we were doing something like a concept sim or a, a, a demonstration. And I can't tell you how you know, heartening that is to look back and see people that are interested instead of people that are on their phones or like, oh, <laughs> I'm supposed to be paying attention. I loved going to this class. Um, this is just a note. If I, if I wanted to publish these survey results, I would need the consent of the students. You have to get human ethics uh, approval. So this is the next slide is something that, that shouldn't be shown. So don't take any pictures. Okay, um, so this is Physics 1020. It's an algebra-based mechanics course, first-year mechanics course. Um, and it was offered in the fall, so the semester before I offered my flipped classroom. Um, the learning gains were slightly positive. This was the distribution of the learning gains. This plot came out of that SBSS tool, and the, the student did it, and I don't actually know how to use it, so I can't make any changes to these plots. So. Um, uh, this was actually surprising because uh, they had positive, learn slightly positive learning gains, but traditional lecture classes, if they have no active component, often have learning losses. So even after a year of instruction in physics, students would have learning losses. Um, even uh, graduate students would show learning losses on this mechanics test after a year of instruction. So that was kind of cool that there was a slightly positive uh, learning gain. So this is uh, winter uh, 2019. That's the same semester I offered the flipped classroom. But this is a calculus-based course um, uh, with 116 students, slightly positive uh, learning gains. There's a, the reason I mentioned about not being able to change the plots is because there's a point, there's like one outlier over here that you can't see on this scale. And I wanted to make it visible, but I couldn't do it. So, Anyway, that's why it looks so, um, so odd to be off-center like that. But um, this was the flipped classroom. So the learning gains were much more positive. Um, still relatively small statistics, right? This class only had 26. There were more in the class. Only 26 did the pre- and post-test because, big surprise, you have to offer an incentive to get them to take it. We didn't offer it this semester. We did offer it this semester in both of these classes, so we had a lot more participation. Um, so this isn't very Gaussian, but if you treat uh, these things as Gaussian and plot them as the mean and the error on the mean, this is what it looks like. These are the traditional lectures, and this is the flipped classroom result. So when I saw this, I was really excited. Um, I didn't have to adjust the grades. We usually do in our first year courses, but two thirds had a B or higher. Two thirds of the students had a B or higher in this course. I wanted to curve down, but people told me I wasn't allowed. Okay, so these are the types of assessments we normally collected. Um, okay, so guys, this is exciting. I wanted to see equal learning gains or at least not too much worse, because I loved teaching the class this way. I looked forward to going to class to see the students. And I was like, OK, they just can't be worse. After the, the, you know, the focus group results, you know, they just have to be at least as good as the traditional lectures. And then I can keep doing it and, and make it better. But this, this was significant here, significantly different from zero. And even in the distributions, you can see there's a lot more uh, more positive learning gains than in these other courses. Okay, so we had all our traditional assessments, um, clickers, online homework, labs, tutorials, midterm and final, that total score uh, for the whole semester, and then the seek scores and comments that we could look at. Um, and now we have new data available from this mechanics survey, the pre and post test scores, the individual learning gains, you can, uh, the website where they take the test, it records the time it takes to answer each question. So you could go in and do deeper analysis and say, well, this person spent five seconds on each question. Maybe I could, you know, not use that result. Um, and then I have the focus group responses that I can think about. So this is the summary of correlations for the traditional classroom. Um, and there's some interesting points uh, to note here. So 
I have here the pre-test, post-test, and then the learning gains as calculated as I described, midterm tutorials, all the normal things that we have here. And uh, red, dark red means highly correlated, so it's one all along the diagonal, and then dark blue means highly uncorrelated. And so white or pink or light blue is sort of you know, medium correlated. And so if you look down this column for the individual normalized learning gains, it, it looks like things are not really very correlated with that individualized, individual normalized learning gain. So whatever that learning gain is measuring, we're not measuring it in our normal assessments necessarily. Um, another thing which was interesting, but perhaps not surprising, if you saw the Natasha Holmes uh, talk, which I think was the first pedagogy lecture so many years now ago. Um, if you look at our lab scores, our labs aren't really correlated with any of the other scores in the, um, uh, that we have either. And the most correlated are the clicker, the Wiley online uh, homework, because this was a traditional lecture, and the tutorials in decreasing order. So the clicker, which was an active engagement sort of thing, uh, the homework, which was sort of you know, active engagement, and the tutorials. I'm just you know, noting. So uh, unfortunately, I don't know how to use Excel very well, and um, this next slide has different shadings for different numbers, so you can't like, just immediately glance, but the idea is the same. So highly correlated is dark red, um, highly uncorrelated is uh, dark blue, and then it, it adjusted the shading scale based on the numbers in the chart, and I don't know how to fix the shading scale, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe someone can teach me how to use it. But here at the bottom we have the learning gain, again, is uh, blue. The only thing it's really correlated with is the post-test score, but that's probably not um, too surprising. Um, and then most, in, in this flipped classroom, most correlated with the class participation grade here, other than the post-test score. Um, the conclusions from this one are not exactly the same as the, from the traditional classroom. It's also still small statistics. I am doing the pre and post test uh, quizzes this semester for the traditional classrooms and I'm gonna do it again next semester for whichever first year courses are offered. Um, so we will accumulate <laughs> statistics over time um, and we're also thinking about changing some things like removing the labs and making them a separate um, course and things like that. So we'll have some data from before we make that change and some data from after so we can try to use that to evaluate our courses. So what will I do differently? Not necessarily by choice, I will have fewer people in the room. So because of a scheduling sort of mix up and then out of um, pity maybe for me for offering the course this way for the first time, I had another professor in the room. So I did have another professor and a postdoc who were in the room helping to circulate with me. Um, I do think based on that experience that I could do it by myself, but I make sure I wear my Fitbit because I want credit for all those steps I get walking, especially in a room like this, up and down the stairs. So this semester I will only have a, uh, a TA in the room with me, so one less person. Um, and I will use the Wiley book um, because uh, um, that's the book that we use for the other first year courses and we don't want to have to make the students buy more than one book. Um, improvements that I would like to do. Um, I want to try and do a better job of explaining how the course will work on the first day. Um, they seem to get it, according to the focus group results, right? They had to do the learning themselves, right? So that's sort of the point. And then the, the scores, um, even if I hadn't done the FCI, the results of the letter grades say to me that they that it was better in the um, active engagement course than the traditional lectures. I'm going to have multiple in-class midterms um, to move toward quasi-continual assessment. I'm going to start off this semester with this weekly structure that I ended up with by the end of the last semester. Um, it, it worked well. I'll also offer incentives from the beginning. 
Um, it has been suggested, I believe, by a member of the audience to put fake comments and questions in the online discussion groups to motivate discussion. So I will be doing that. Um, I was skeptical, but I went to a, a, U, a UM Learn course at Cattle, and they taught us how to do the badges, and we got badges for learning how to do things, and it was amazing how motivating that was. <laughs> so it might actually be worth it to have the students do badges, like, you know, you did this many homework problems, yay, or, you know, good job, I don't know. It doesn't matter. It just motivates them to do things. And it doesn't, it's not associated with their grade in any way, it's just encouragement. Um, and then I would like to ask, you've heard sort of what I do, did, um, in all honesty, are there any suggestions, or the things that you do? Um, especially for the clicker questions, that's a hard one for me because I wanna give three to five minutes for the clicker questions that I ask. And some students can answer faster than that. And if your class is mostly clicker questions, that means that there are some students who are waiting most of the time. So I briefly had the thought of having like a project or something that if they had finished, they could work on something while they're waiting. I'm not sure how to implement that. So does anybody, anybody use clickers that, what, how do you handle the waiting? Say suck it up or anybody? Can you just pay more money like the other time? Um, yeah, that's possible, but then they'll just answer all of them and then still be waiting, right? So I, I, I had thought of that too. Yeah? They're supposed to be doing that. Um, they're supposed to be thinking and then, you know, working with people around. So that's part of it. Um, so that's a tough one. I think I will limit it. I sometimes waited a little longer than five minutes if people said they needed more help, but I think I have to limit it. Um, uh, there was a point back there. <laughs> they ask them, give them extra points if they can guess what the next question will be. Oh, that's an interesting one. Oh, okay. I'm never predictable in my clicker questions. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> A what? For each question, do you have a, the minimum amount that the students took to answer a particular question and the maximum amount and the average? Um, I don't know if anybody knows if you can get that from the clicker results, but what I do know is I can watch at what percent, you know, what number of students have answered by a certain time. Yes. And so I could say, you know, three quarters of the students have answered. I'm going to announce 10 more seconds and then just end it, okay. something if, like that. If you have the data distribution, then you say, well, if you expect them to answer in three minutes, but in reality, let's say 70% of the students are answering in one minute. Then I know, yeah. Then you adjust it. You know, now we'll give it two minutes. Yeah. So look at the data oh. if you have it. Here's an interesting question. Um, do you know how long professors usually wait in a traditional classroom after asking a question? To it's, it's about 20 or 30 seconds. And if, when you do the clickers, you realize the students need three to five minutes. I was sometimes waiting longer, so I can at least, you know, do less. Okay. Um, any other suggestions? Yeah? That's a good question. Other people have brought that up. So my rule of thumb that I learned when I was an undergraduate was that you should spend about three hours of, of time for every hour that you're in class. Just a rule of thumb. Sometimes it's more than that, sometimes it's less than that. And we expect them in the traditional classrooms to be reading. Show of hands, how many people think they actually read? Okay, so I don't think I'm asking them to do any more than we're asking them to do in the traditional classroom. It's just I'm actually assessing them for it. They have to do the pre-lecture video and I know whether they did or not, they get points for it. They have to do the pre-lecture quiz. They get a score for that. They have to be in class because they get credit for their classwork, right? 
Um, so uh, some students on the Sikhs did complain that they felt it took longer. I had to watch the pre-lecture videos, and then if I didn't understand, I had to go and read the book, and you know, but that's, that's what you should be doing in a traditional lecture. When, when I did traditional lectures, as if I am never going to do them again, um, I would get, I don't see why we even have to come to class because I could just get everything from the book. So now I'm doing in class what would, you know, be additional to, you know, getting everything from the book. There was somebody, yeah? So they are, um, I usually assign three to five for each class, and they range, it depends, it's usually a total of about 15 minutes. But they can pause and rewind, they can watch it as many times as they want, um, they can uh, try the, um, they can open up the bridge questions and say, uh-oh, I don't, I can't answer this first one. I better go back and watch the videos again. And there are also more videos available that they can watch. They, they, they have access to all of them. It's just that only certain ones are assigned. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking something like a bonus question or yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's a, maybe not even worth points, but just get them thinking. Yeah. So the first question is worth something. That person answers it, but there's other questions up there, but they're not. Well, I could have like UM Learn quizzes, so they answer the clicker question, but then they can be on UM Learn answering you know, while other questions while they're waiting finish. for the clicker question to finish. Yeah, I should probably write that down because I'll forget it. Yeah? So um, I, I have a question, and maybe it'll be a little bit of a setup before I get to the question. But um, so one thing I've been trying to do in my teaching is use op open educational resources, which are much less expensive for students. But that also means that the publishers of those resources don't have the resources to prepare Okay, so my answer to that is that there are free lectures, videos, MIT makes a bunch, right? So you could curate your own video, like not you making them, but you know, make a course package of videos from free sources, right? The other thing is you don't have to have pre-lecture videos. How many people had pop quizzes when they were undergraduates? I did. <laughs> so instead of you know, reading the text and then having a pop quiz, you could say read this and then have the, in UM Learn, if there were no online homework, you could make your own quizzes in UM Learn to have a pre-lecture quiz. So you don't have to have videos. It could be pre-lecture reading and, the, yeah? But, but you think there's value in the pre-lecture videos because you did go with a different textbook and you didn't pick one that was free. Um, Is that true? At that time, it, it was offered <laughs> as an enticement to be free for the students. Wiley is not free and Sapling wouldn't be free this semester and I didn't want to force them to buy two books. Um, the value for that is I don't have to curate my own, I mean I have to go through the videos that are available on the website but I don't have to go to you know, MIT and say okay how many of these videos are useful, which ones can I use, can I make up my own questions to go with them and things like that. So it's mostly for ease uh, on me. Um, okay, so this is my last slide. Active engagement is key, and any amount of active engagement helps. You don't have to completely flip your classroom to add active engagement to the classroom. Um, Quasi-continuous assessment is recommended. That includes self-assessment. Um, at lunch, I was telling the students that, you know, you may have heard of some places where they don't have, they don't assign homework. 
They, they have the lectures and there's a final, that's it. So the students have to do themselves the practice, set themselves up, I have to read so much, I have to do these, I have to test my own understanding, I have to do my own self-assessment. We have to motivate them to do that by giving them assignments. Um, and then think about what you want them to learn, how you'll guide them to learn it, and then how will you assess to emphasize what you want them to learn. Um, and then, oh man, I would like to do skills-based uh, tests, but I just, it would take so much work. <laughs> but uh, this is an interesting way. So the students have to learn a certain amount of skills and they get as long as they need to do each of those skills. Um, but developing those assessments would be very, um, and eye clickers, if you use them, they add both engagement because the students have to answer, they have to do something, they have to think, and that's their self-assessment. Um, and then in the talk, that will eventually be posted, I guess. Um, here's a list of sources. This is mostly um, for physics. Uh, but this ANTA sort has a lot, th this uh, website has a lot of other um, evaluation instruments for different fields. So that's the last. Are there any other questions? Um, Jan? I don't remember. Um, I, I did look at them, but I was reading the comments. And of the people that wrote comments, um, about half of them really liked doing the course that way. Um, but the other half said they learned less than they usually do in other courses, which isn't true because I have the FCI results that show that that's not true on average. What they mean is I didn't teach them as much as they might have seen in other uh, courses because they had to do it themselves. I should know that for this talk, but I just, I don't, I can tell you later. I'll have to go look. There, it was lower. It was lower than when I gave traditional, but that's not unusual. And it's because they have to do the work. Lower when you gave it, like. Yes. Yeah? I think of the learning gains test. Like, what is it? Is it the pre assessment is stuff they haven't learned yet, and the post assessment is stuff, or is the post assessment it's stuff? It's the same question. So that's my question. Is it stuff we, so the post assessment is stuff you expected them to know before they got? So it's, it's, uh, it's exactly the same questions on the pre and post test. So the pre-test, if they've never, our students have had physics before usually in high school. Um, if they haven't at other universities, it's often true that they haven't had physics. So you would be testing sort of preconceptions or misconceptions on the pre-test. It's the same questions on the post-test. It's all con like just general concepts. Yes, six, six concepts, 30 questions. And, and they're, they're they're basic mechanics concepts, right? We're not asking them to write down, you know, the formula for the range and projectile motion or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Um, I'm curious about why you, why you wouldn't make the pre and post part of the student's grade, because they have to. That's what we did in the winter term. And that's why we had uh, 75 or 119 students participating instead of 26. So what I had to get the other first year instructors to do was agree to give 1% of the overall grade, 1% of the overall grade for completing both the pre and post test. Yeah? Um, yeah, yeah, so um, it means that they, they did worse on the post-test than they did on the pre-test. So um, one explanation, and this is just a theory, is that when they come in for the pre-test, they have a lot of misconceptions, but they, they have some confidence that they know what they're doing. And then during the course of the semester, 
We break down all their misconceptions, but we don't build, we don't build anything back up. So they do worse on the post-test than they did on the pre-test. That's just a theory. I haven't, uh, I don't know if any, I don't know if, Wouter, do you know if any literature exists to study why that's true? It is true for, tradi for traditional lectures, though. For traditional lectures, the, it's often worse after, I mean, more often than not, it's worse after a semester of instruction than, than before. Yeah? Um, one of the data sets that you showed us had um, your flipped class comparison to like a traditional lecture where um, you outperformed. But in your comment, you said that some of the students would have preferred to have not engaged in, uh, in the actual class. Do you think that you would normalize that data if you had an orientation of, say, two weeks where you flipped the classes, where one group had um, the traditional style and See, I have no idea. <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of um, asking for your prediction. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, so the, the flipped classroom, I think, was just so much more enjoyable for everyone, in, me included. Um, but it was a lot more work for the students. So, you know, some of them didn't like it, but their, their learning gains were better. See, one, um, one of your examples, and the reason mm -hmm. I'm kind of thinking about this, one of your examples was a university where you could hear the lecture. Yeah. So in some cases, I would love that, mm -hmm. and I would completely sign up for that case. But if I was in something that I was not confident in, I would love to attend your class. Yeah. I need assistance. So this isn't necessarily what you mean, but it reminded me of that another thing that I do at the beginning of the course is I, ex I explain the first day how it's going to be. There's going to be a lot of peer instruction. People are going to have to work in groups, and I say, if you think for some reason that you will not be able to perform well in a class like this, come and see me. Now, no one came to see me, um, but I have a son with autism, and I know he might not do well in a classroom like this. So I wanted to give students that opportunity. I know that's not exactly what you were right, asking. Yeah. Um, so I had a discussion with the chair of our department, and I, I'm very excited, <laughs> and I'm like, all our first year courses should be flipped, this is so cool, it worked, and we should just do it, and he's like, whoa, 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 calm down. It's okay if we offer some traditional lectures, and some flipped lectures, and some online lectures. Eventually, it will percolate into this, which course should I take, which professor should I do? Well, this professor, she's nuts. And she does this thing called a flipped classroom. You don't want to take that, right? I mean, it's going to, the students are eventually going to know. And we should do a better job of advertising. I don't know how to do that right now, but saying, you know, the, the winter term course is going to be a flipped classroom this way. You know, if you would rather take it that way, you could try. Um, I don't know. Yeah? I'm not sure if you said this. Um, do you tell the students what the benefits are? Of yes, the, the first day. Like you actually state that your marks will be higher. Yeah, I do. Those clicker questions I asked you at the beginning, yeah. I ask those, yeah. and I go beyond that. I show them the results of some studies uh, that was actually suggested at the Mosey Institute um, to and do those that. Students still, at the end of the day, gave a low rating for the class. Yeah, because they had to do more work, okay. even though they got better scores. Even though they got better <laughs> on scores, average. On yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It just maybe needs to be reinforced yeah. along the way that this is an actual benefit yeah. for you. So, that so are you thinking of preference for, I, I'm just, I'm coming back to your, I don't think I answered yeah. your question, so. Uh, so. I think if you have to leave, you can go. <laughs> We're past the time. Is there a reception? Or, okay. Uh, in the student, science student? So if, if we want, we could end and then go over to the science student lounge. But so your, your, question, your question was about preference, like demonstrating the flipped method to, so that, that might work in like um, for a second semester course. I could go and do flipped for a week in a traditional lecture, room, lecture class 
and say, you know, for 1030, if you want to take the class this way instead of a traditional lecture, then look for my section or something like that. But I don't know how to do it for like, you know, just the first, the first so course. One of the things that's really scary about being a first year student is in a lot of ways, myself, I'm thinking back a bit, and also the people that communicate with them, and in some ways they don't know what they want. They're actually asking us for guidance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're okay with trying it out, especially if there's peer pressure involved, but you go and try it out, and maybe you love it, and maybe you despise it, but we've actually engaged with them, and they had an opportunity to make a decision for themselves, and then maybe we should give them the opportunity to change to something that would be preferable, because if you told me that I could read your physics textbook and get like the same grade, but I just stay in my room and I don't talk to them, <laughs> some days that works for me. Yeah. Um, whereas for other students, they're very outgoing, and they like to like learn as a team and participate with their friends, and, and so like the social influence may be the tendency. And look, you can do active engagement by yourself, and you you can be doing the practicing. The problem is that if you gave the students that option, a lot of them would just never open that book yeah. <laughs> until right before the midterm or the final, right? So. Um, any other questions? Yeah? So for the, uh, the learning game, those students that did the, the survey on their own without any sort of incentive, what was their motivation if they didn't have to do it? Um, so that first semester, oh, so it's, it's a long story, but I had to get, um, I wanted to get human ethics approval to be able to publish the results. But that takes time. And I initially did it without saying I would offer any incentives. And so I had to make the choice uh, to take, you know, give the quizzes that first semester without any incentive. I mean, I, I didn't have any other choice. I didn't have approval to, if I gave, an, if I gave them an incentive, I couldn't publish the data because I couldn't change what I had applied for in the human ethics approval. So I, I did it, and then it turned out I didn't get enough data to publish anyway, so I should have just asked the first year instructors, because I wasn't teaching that semester, so it was other instructors, to offer you know, percentage points. I'm just wondering how much that shifted the data that you got, because it's, it, those were motivated individuals. That well, the other thing about the first semester is that the, court, the, the quiz was offered in class. Um, and that was another thing that changed. I think uh, Jan was one of those, and uh, they, the other instructors, I, do, I wouldn't want to do it either. It basically takes the whole class period, so that's two classes you're giving up for the pre and post test. And uh, in the second semester, it was offered online on the student's own time, so. Yeah. Okay, thank you.